Woke lawyers panic as race and ethnicity get canceled in law school admissions rules. Coming from Reuters, ABA looks to strip race and ethnicity from law school diversity rules. And of course, there are plenty of law school deans and lawyers that are not happy with this. They say, also from Reuters, cutting race and ethnicity from ABA's law school diversity rules goes too far. Too far? You Wouldn't you just want to let people get admitted who actually were qualified? All of this is coming out because of the Supreme Court decision blocking race and ethnicity as a consideration to accept people into colleges that don't belong there based on merit. The American Bar Association is a membership organization that provides resources for legal professionals, law school accreditation, and model ethics for the law industry. They recently just got through fighting over this. Also from Reuters, law deans bark at course uniformity proposed by American Bar Association. Course uniformity saying, look, if we're going to say this institution meets our standard and everyone is relying on this as really the gold standard of what's going on with law, but these deans don't want to meet minimum requirements in terms of what the students need to actually accomplish when they're in law school. They fought and they lost because the rules were passed by the ABA. Law school courses to become more uniform under new ABA accreditation rule that will also control what they're able to teach inside law schools. So it can't just be nonstop critical race theory. From Reuters, ABA looks to strip race and ethnicity from law school diversity rules. The American Bar Association is poised to eliminate references to race and ethnicity from its law school diversity and inclusion rules to comply with the U.S. Supreme Court's 2023 ruling barring colleges from considering race in admissions. The ABA body that accredits law schools voted to gather public comments on a revised rule under which law schools must provide access to, quote, all persons, including those with identities that historically have been a disadvantage or excluded from the legal profession. Okay, but you still have to actually have the grades and the mental ability to get into that school. That would replace the current rule that schools provide full opportunities for racial and ethnic minorities and have a diverse student body with respect to gender, race, and ethnicity. Republican attorneys general from 21 states in June told the ABA that the current diversity and inclusion standard runs afoul of the court's ruling by requiring explicitly illegal consideration of race. Two weeks later, 19 Democratic attorney generals responded with their own letter defending the legality of the current standard. But of course, it's not legal. The ABA was already working to revise the standard when it received the dueling letters, but the new version goes further than previous proposals by eliminating reference to race, ethnicity, and gender, among other things. The ABA will circulate the proposal for public comment and could approve it as early as its meeting in November. The change would then need final approval by the ABA's House of Delegates, which meets next February. The latest proposal shifts focus away from a laundry list of identities to the rule's larger access goal, said University of Oklahoma law professor Carla Pratt, who sits on the ABA's Council of the Section of Legal Education and Admission to the Bar. The proposal also calls for the diversity and inclusion standard to be renamed the Access to Legal Education and the Profession Standard. The only reference to race appears in guidance clarifying that the rules don't require schools to take race or other identity characteristics into account in admissions or hiring decisions. And the accreditation is very important because that's saying, okay, this is legitimacy conferred upon the law school. So if the ABA is saying, yeah, this is among the best law schools that we have in the United States, they have our approval, they meet all of our standards, so you can trust people coming out of this law school. The proposed change comes at a time when diversity and inclusion initiatives are under increasing fire. The committee that developed the new rule reviewed the Supreme Court's ruling, anti-diversity and inclusion laws adopted by various states, as well as the various letters from state's attorneys general. So this is what they're complaining about. From Reuters, cutting race and ethnicity from ABA's law school diversity rules goes too far, according to critics. And why would these law schools want additional rules placed on them? Why would they want 
a standard to be placed on them to say, hey, look, we're forcing you to push this diversity and inclusion standard in these law schools. They want the additional push on them. They want the clamp down from the ABA insisting on diversity, equity, and inclusion standards, because if they have that, they could use that as an excuse to say, hey, look, we may not have students that know what they're doing. We may not have students that meet a certain educational standard. They're not here based on merit. But we have to do this because if we don't do this, we'll lose our ABA accreditation. And the ABA is saying, no, you're not going to put this off on us because the Republican attorneys general, for example, or someone else will sue the ABA and say, look, you're out of compliance with the Supreme Court decision. You can't do this. They know they can't do it. And it would make the American Bar Association look even worse than they do. And there's plenty wrong with those guys. But they can't be caught trying to push a standard that's clearly illegal clearly not in compliance with the Supreme Court's decisions. Eliminating the terms race and ethnicity from the American Bar Association's law school accreditation rules will hobble longstanding efforts to bring in diverse students and faculty, according to critics in public comments on the proposal. Now, we, they don't, no one needs to take students and put them into extra difficult situations that they can't cognitively manage. And this is not about skin color or race or gender or sexual preference. This is if you're not qualified to be in this school, you should not be in this school. It's not good for the school. It's not good for the legal community. It's not good for the student. Go where you're a good fit. For example, these non-ABA schools accept all kinds of people with all kinds of life and work situations and actually accommodate those people. They take their curriculum and they'll alter their curriculum, not necessarily make it easier, but they'll let you do the curriculum on a schedule that you're comfortable with. Like you could do this from home instead of watching TV. They call it flexible learning options. Flexibility is a major perk of non-ABA law schools, with many offering part-time, evening, and online classes. The adaptability is valuable for students who balance their studies with professional or personal commitments. The Colleges of Law is able to provide a curriculum that accommodates your schedule, not the other way around. So you can go to law school on your own time and do it like the way you want to do it. And when you go to an easier school like this, they really do make it as easy as possible for you to pass. Usually a non-ABA accredited law school is significantly cheaper than attending an ABA accredited law school. Lower tuition rates means reducing the need for substantial student loans. In a non-ABA school, you can get practical skills and local focus, so you can learn things you can actually apply in your local market when you're actually looking to get a job after you've completed your legal degree. Whether you're a working adult, a parent, or someone transitioning careers, the inclusive nature of non-ABA law schools ensures that more individuals can pursue their passion for law without the barriers often presented by traditional law schools. They kind of take everybody. Or it's as close to it as you're going to get. The ABA, which sets accreditation standards for 197 law schools in the U.S., currently requires law schools to provide, quote, full opportunities for racial and ethnic minorities and have a diverse student body with respect to gender, race, and ethnicity. Oh no, we're the law school. We wanted to make it fair. We wanted to comply with the Supreme Court. The ABA forced us to do this. They told us we had to have full opportunities for racial and ethnic minorities and have a diverse student body. And we've got to mix up the genders and the races. We, we can't do anything on our own. We can't make this decision. We can't lose our ABA status. Oh, but you don't have that excuse anymore, do you? The proposed new standard renamed the Access to Legal Education and the Profession Standard eliminates references to race, ethnicity, and gender, and instead requires law schools to provide access to, quote, persons including those with identities that historically have been disadvantaged or excluded from the legal profession. And when you see a statement like that, you still say, like, well, isn't that still a diversity thing? It is. It's just not as absurd as the other one. A subcommittee of the ABA's Council on the Section of Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar spent months revising the standard after the U.S. Supreme Court in 2023 barred colleges and universities from considering race in admissions resulting from a pair of cases filed against Harvard University and the University of North Carolina. The council voted in August to gather public comments on the change through September 30th. 
Many of the 10 public comments opposing the change said the ABA had gone further than the court's ruling requires, while three comments supported the change. Quote, nothing in the court's ruling precludes schools from continuing to pursue diversity as an objective, the law deans wrote in their opposing letter, adding that the Supreme Court only limited the means by which schools may pursue their diversity goals. Deans from the law schools at the University of Michigan, the University of California, Berkeley, Vanderbilt, and Boston University are among the letter's signatories, and there's over 70 people that signed off on this, deans of ABA-approved schools, but you know something, enough with you guys. The LSAC said in a letter to the ABA that the revised standard would, quote, undermine the progress that has been made towards fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion in legal education. Well, sure, take that up with the Supreme Court, though, because your illegal standards are not legal. They can't continue. A handful of people and groups submitted comments in favor of the revised standard, including a coalition of attorneys general from 17 Democratic-led states, though they encouraged the ABA to restore diversity in the name of the standard. It's not yet clear what the Supreme Court's affirmative action ban has had on the diversity of law classes. The ABA will not release detailed demographic statistics on the first school admitted since the court's ruling in December. We've seen at Harvard Law School that the enrollment of students of color has dropped after the affirmative action ban, but we've seen in other colleges where it stayed the same and other colleges where it's gone up. In colleges where it stayed the same and the diversity has gone up, they're getting threatened by Edward Blum, who won the Supreme Court case, that they'd better start to disclose how they did that because it looks like they are cheating and not following the Supreme Court's ruling. He's threatening them with a lawsuit if they don't comply. So the absolute final decision on this won't be passed until February, although it looks like it will be almost passed and completed by November. And here's what they lost on when they were trying to fight the uniformity standards of what was being taught at law school. I mean, how could you not have uniformity? What are you accrediting if you're not accrediting that, yes, this is a high quality institution that by definition is teaching these important subjects to these standards? You have to have standards. If you don't have standards, what do you have? You have diversity, equity, and inclusion. So they objected, Law Dean's Balk, a course uniformity proposed by American Bar Association, and they lost. Law school courses have become more uniform under new ABA accreditation rule. And keeping in mind, they are accrediting them. They are essentially licensing them to utilize their approval of the ABA. So they're the ones who get to say what the standard is, not the deans. The deans need to ask, persuade. The deans can make suggestions. They can certainly give comments. They accept comments at the ABA, but they don't make the decision. The ABA makes the decision because it's the reputation of the ABA that's on the line. Law schools will soon be required to set minimum learning outcomes for every class they offer and ensure those outcomes are the same across all sections of required courses. And if you've ever been in, say, high school or college or anything beyond that, you would say, what do you mean minimum learning outcomes? Yeah meaning you actually have to teach something that people are learning. You can't just have political classes. You can't just have ideology-oriented classes. If you're going to take the stamp of approval from the American Bar Association, you need to be teaching lawyers who are out in the public protecting people's rights and even their freedoms. The American Bar Association's Council of the Section of Legal Education and Admissions to the Bar on Friday adopted a series of changes to its student learning outcome standards aiming to clarify law school's obligations. The adopted changes also mandate all first-year classes include one early assessment that gives students feedback on their performance prior to a final exam. Academic support must also be made available to students who fail to attain a satisfactory level of achievement. So actual learning and also actual helping of students that can't make it on their own. Outside of extraordinary circumstances, 80% of each first-year law student's teachers must now be full-time faculty members, which ensures new students don't primarily have adjunct instructors. While some legal academics welcome the greater oversight imposed by the revised standards, others argue that the changes amount to micromanaging by the ABA that will limit the flexibility and control law professors have over their class content. Yeah, it will limit what you can do in your law school. What you say is appropriate is not necessarily actually appropriate. 
The ABA will let you know what is and what is not appropriate. More than a third of the nation's law deans, 76, but not half, submitted a comment to the ABA in April opposing the changes and saying they could, quote, harm legal education by placing unnecessary requirements on schools. The proposal is part of a larger movement by the ABA to exert more control over law schools, according to the deans. Yeah, why would they want to exert more control over your law schools? Well, because they're out of control. But in their public comments, supporters of the new requirements said students will benefit from more course uniformity and focus on how individual classes fit into the larger curriculum. They would not have been getting reined in if it wasn't for Edward Blum and his team bringing the case against Harvard and UNC, fighting all of the discriminatory admissions processes. We've seen results now in law schools. We've seen it in college admissions. We've seen it in private industry. We've seen public companies freaking out about it because they know they can't continue to do what they've been doing. People need to get in, get by, and be approved and move on in society based on merit, not based on race, not based on skin color, and not based on sexual preferences. Let me know what you think of all this in the comments below. Always love to see your ideas. Please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you again soon with another story. And if I don't see you, I will miss you.